and thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, so, you know, I'd like to dedicate this session in honor of all of the languages that are spoken in Calgary, more than 140 of them apparently, but in particularly, I I'd like to honor the languages that have been spoken here for a long time by the peoples for whom these lands are their traditional territories. So that includes the Blackfoot language spoken by the Nitsitapi people of the Gainai, Siksika, and Pigani nations. The Yathka language spoken by the Stony Nakoda nations of Menifni. Uh, those are the Chiniki, Wesley, and Bearspaw nations. The Tsutina language, which belongs to the family of Dene languages that are spoken in the north. And uh, also the Michif language, which is spoken by the people of the Metis nation. Uh, it's an utterly fascinating language that was born in the 1800s out of a marriage between mostly the Plains Cree language and French. Um, so the way that we're going to proceed this evening is Peter and I are both going to share a little bit of our personal language stories with you. Um, we're both going to read from some of our work. I'll be reading from my new book, Memory Speaks, and Peter will be reading from a work in progress as well as a previously published work. We'll have a little bit of a conversation between us that will be recorded so that people can watch this event offline. Uh, but then at the end of that discussion and readings, uh, we're going to turn off the recording and invite you all to come for a free for all discussion. So I've got a glass of wine ready. I'm going to pour one out after we stop recording and uh, we'll just have a little bit of a chat. Um, and uh, hopefully that will uh, round out the evening. So what I'd like to do is start off by uh, sharing with you some pictures from my family album. Uh, that will give you a little bit of a sense of where it is that I come from, because it's not always apparent when people look at me where my roots are. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of an idea of that. So you should see on your screen a photo of two very beautiful people who happen to be my parents. So these are my own origins. Um, my uh, dad comes from an area of the Czech Republic that's known as Moravia, right on the Austrian and Slovakian border. And it is just a beautiful countryside, uh, full of vineyards and orchards. Uh, the area is steeped in wine culture. And these are little, these little houses are actually wine cellars where people make, store and drink their wine. Uh, that's in my father's home village of Moravska Novaves. My mother comes from the northern area of the country, and it's a very lush green area of woods and rolling hills. This is the cemetery where my ancestors are buried. And this was my very first home where I came home from the hospital. And this is my little family just a few months before we left the Czech Republic. Um, so until this point in my life, I'm the one who's in my father's arms. Uh, I was almost two at this point. Um, and Czech had been the only language I had ever heard or spoken around me. Uh, and then shortly after we left the country, we rattled around Europe for a while. So it kind of opened up my life to linguistic mayhem. Um, I heard Italian because we lived in Italy for a while, uh, German because we lived in Austria for a while. And then eventually we boarded a plane. This is us waiting uh, to get onto our plane to Montreal. Uh, I'm here, the second child from the right, and it's just a few days short of my fourth birthday at this point. So once we arrived in Montreal, of course, we had to adapt to the very brutally cold winters. And back then, the winters truly were colder than they are now. And we also had to adapt to two new languages. Uh, I learned French before I learned English, um, and we happened to land right uh, in the midst of some of uh, Quebec's greatest language conflicts. So just after the FLU crisis, where the Quebec uh, deputy minister was murdered, and just before the passage of Bill 101. Uh, so that was kind of a unique time in Montreal's history. I went to school in English. This is me around the time I started school. And this really marks the point in my life where English took over and dominated all of the other languages that I had previously learned. Um, kids are incredible language assimilators. 
Um, and I had spent some time in my book talking about why that is, why they're so eager to adapt to the majority language around them. Um, in fact, the odds are really stacked against them maintaining their heritage language. And so what happened is as um, I grew older and, and as more and more we spoke English in the home, it created a distance from my family culture. So more and more the incredibly rich and wonderful and joyful culture of my home country receded into the background. And um, I admit that there were big chunks of my lifetime during which I, I started to see it as fairly irrelevant to me, um, especially in my early adult years. And the other thing that happens when you distance yourself from your uh, mother tongue and your native uh, culture is you begin to see a distance between yourself and your elders. Um, my parents did not learn English to the same degree of proficiency that I did, especially my father. Um, and that created a bit of a rift in our uh, relationships for the simple reason that although we could still talk to them easily enough about day-to-day -day practical matters, um, we didn't really have the linguistic resources, especially with my dad, to talk about um, you know, complicated emotional things or what our political views were, or to talk about some of the abstract ideas we were learning about in school. Um, so this is one of the consequences of, of language loss that I see. And um, as I began to reflect on my own relationship to Czech in my life, um, I decided to learn a little bit more about language loss more broadly and discovered that my own experience uh, where my native tongue just kind of drifted into the background was extremely typical uh, of immigrants in similar situations. Um, so even in a multicultural country like Canada, where we claim to support people's attachment to their mother tongues and their home cultures, um, the reality is that that people's ties to those languages dwindle extremely quickly. Uh, by the second generation, very few uh, people speak the language well, certainly not as well as they do English. And it's very common for people who immigrated as children to experience a lot of erosion of the language that was actually the first language that they ever spoke in life. So th that's kind of where this book comes from is that experience of loss and trying to understand it, trying to understand its consequences. Um, more broadly, what we see in the world as well is that as, as people's languages struggle um, against the you know, huge force of the majority language, smaller languages are really vulnerable. So it's estimated that more than half of the world's 7,000 languages will be extinct within a few generations. Um, and within the Canadian context, of course, um, we know that many of our indigenous languages are threatened as well. Um, and some of my book talks a little bit about the, um, uh, the reasons why it's so difficult to, um, for the, these smaller amount languages to balance out against the force of the, the dominant language. I think what it would take to stop this level of language loss and language erosion is a lot more than we're currently doing. I think right now we've taken a very passive approach. Uh, we claim to celebrate and honor all kinds of languages, but we don't make space for them. We don't accommodate them in the way that would be necessary in order for them to have a seat at the table as public languages, languages in which important things are done. We kind of tell people, it's fine to speak your language at home. We have no problem with that. But all of the research shows that if a language is confined to the home, its chances of surviving in a person's mind as a fully fledged adult language are very, very poor. So we, we need to do more than that if we truly want to be a thriving multilingual society. Um, and I think one of the reasons we haven't is because at heart, we're not fully comfortable I think with the idea of being a multilingual nation um, and of people having a very profound and deep attachment to a number of different languages that are not among our official languages. So I thought I would start um, our discussion by reading a passage from a chapter in my book that's called Conflict. 
And it talks a little bit about some of the hesitations that I see in society towards um, other languages. The event that I'm describing took place in the Calgary Public Library in pre-pandemic times when I was a regular inhabitant there. I spend much of my working time on the top floor of Calgary's spectacular central library, where I can settle into a swivel chair, plug in my laptop, and soak up the prairie sunlight that ricochets around the office towers on soaring display outside the library's windows. The murmur of conversations around me is an antidote to the overdose of solitude that can come with writing. I'm glad that utter silence is not enforced here. But today, a man is playing music very loudly from his laptop, and a staff member comes over to ask him to turn it down. The man explodes. Why do I need to turn it down? I'm only playing my music to drown out the sound of all these people in here yammering in all these languages. Why don't you tell them to turn down all their languages? There are in fact many different languages spoken in the library. On any given day, I might hear Punjabi, Mandarin, Russian, Arabic, Spanish, Cantonese, Tagalog, Hindi, French, Farsi, Bengali, Turkish, Korean, Urdu, Vietnamese, Italian, or any other of the 140 mother tongues that are claimed by local residents. Calgary is a growing city, reliant on immigration to shore up its labor supply. And the library offers an all-you-can-eat buffet of services for newcomers. As someone who's had to repeatedly wiggle my way into a language from the outside, there's something familiar and almost comforting about being enveloped by a language I don't understand. When I need a mental break from the manuscript I'm tapping out on my computer, I make a game of trying to identify the languages around me. For me, the instinct to peer into a neighbor language is as irresistible as the temptation to gaze from the shadows of a sidewalk on a wintry evening into the glow of a brightly lit room where people are sharing a meal. But this man's explosive response reminds me that not everyone shares this feeling. What many hear instead is an undertone of threat lurking within foreign languages. Although this particular man in the library was less restrained than many of his fellow Canadians, it is not rare, even in a cosmopolitan city like Calgary, to witness a twitchy unease that's triggered by the sounds of other languages. They always sound angry, someone might say, about speakers of a certain tongue, or I think they talk about us, knowing we can't understand. I'm struck by how often I hear people voicing the suspicion that speakers of other languages use their mother tongues to secretly discuss others who are present, as if the private conversations of strangers were actually anybody else's business at all. But in fact, the suspicion is so widespread as to seem almost instinctive. Among speakers of Shoshone, whose language is at risk of imminent extinction, politeness norms bow to this sensitivity and require that Shoshone be set aside in the presence of even a single person who doesn't speak it, lest that person feel that you're talking about them in secret. In conversation, Shoshone speakers must approach strangers linguistically disarmed, palms out and facing upward. Look, no plotting, no gossip, no hidden weapons. The man in the library reminds me of how my classmates' shoulders would stiffen when they heard me and my siblings speaking Czech. He brings to mind all those studies that reveal how children reflexively distance themselves from those who speak another language. To this man, an unfamiliar language signals a difference in kind. At the very least, it says, you and I have had different life experiences and teachings. My values, motives, loyalties, and hatreds are as unknown to you as the contents of my conversation. It's true that two speakers of the same tongue may also have lives that are so different as to seem alien to each other, but a foreign language announces this difference from the very first syllables that are spoken. 
So one of the things I felt was important to do in this book is kind of make the point that I don't think that the reaction that I observed in the library is just something we can chalk up to, you know, the bigots among us. I think uh, it's really important to understand the roots um, of the reactions that we have to languages that aren't familiar to us. And I was struck as I was conducting the research for this book by um, several studies that show that uh, small children arrive in the world extremely ready to attribute language as a socially important marker. So, you know, we only often have this notion that children are pure innocents who have no biases. And it's true that they don't come born with specific biases, but they do seem to come born with the predisposition to look around and notice what the socially relevant categories are. And in particular, they seem to be really attuned to language as a way of dividing people up into categories. So there's one fascinating study that I relate in the book that uh, talks about how uh, children of about the age of five to seven years of age um, will often find it easier to believe that a black man will grow up to be a white man than a person who speaks French can grow up to be a person who speaks English, suggesting that they see language as something that's really part of the essence of a person that's immutable, that's unchangeable. And I think that speaks to the fact that they've kind of glommed on to language as a very important distinction between people in the world around them. Um, so I wanted to um, invite Peter maybe to talk a little bit about his experiences with the languages that he's been growing up with, because I know that you've also had a multilingual uh, background in a country that's known for uh, very conflictual relationships among the various languages. So can you speak to some of the tensions that you might have felt as a child growing up or as a young person growing up in, in South Africa? And can you tell us a little bit about your language background? And, and I understand you have some slides to show us as well. I do have a few that I could show you. Um, and I'll start just by saying I want to come in with the uh, I'll move into that and say that I, I understand that, that, that man in the library and that, that sense of language being threatened. I think of the first time when I spent a day in Rio de Janeiro and I suddenly accidentally found myself on the edges of, of a favela and a group of school kids started hustling me. And that complete inability to communicate with them in a foreign environment was really unsettling and disempowering. And I did not feel that, I don't feel that in South Africa, even though I grew up in a, a bilingual setting. It, we spoke Afrikaans and English at home, Afrikaans among the siblings, English to my dad. I was in an English class, my sister was in an Afrikaans class. So we, we really, Everywhere we went, it was, we used both languages all mm. over, um, but very quickly grew aware of the fact that even though we were there, the Afrikaans is the dominant language amongst the white population there. But white population is less than 10% of the overall population of the region in which I lived. And <clears throat> I will show you There, there we are. So if you look on the screen, you should see, should see the screen now. There's the map of South Africa. And we are looking at this along the edges of that river there. You will see a town called Burgersdorf. It's about there where the arrow is now. Sorry, I would have marked it clearer, but I just put that in while Julie was talking. I, I cribbed her idea of a map to, to give you a sense <laughs> of orientation. So. Grow, growing up there, the more than 70 people of the percent of the people there speak is it Kosa. And so I spoke English and Afrikaans in the home, but a lot of the farm kids grew up speaking is it Kosa all around and would come to school and speak is it Kosa. So on the playground, even though it was a white segregated school, we spoke Kosa. That was just it. So 
Despite speaking two minority languages, I am, was always aware that these two were both languages of privileges, two official languages of the country spoken by people who were protected by apartheid laws. So we were just across the border from two independent um, countries, the Republic of the Free State, so that above the river, north of the river, and up there were two independent Boer republics. We were right on the border there. And um, in fact, many of the battles during the Anglo-Boer War, the South African War, uh, took place right there in our town. So it is strewn with battlefields. There are two concentration camps just outside town. So we, we really grew up in the midst of the, um, of the people now to get this to move on. So if you have a look, there's a panoramic view of the town that I grew up in. Yeah. So just to, to give you a sense, I grew up in that place there. Just there where that little arrow is over there, the thin arrow, is um, the fact that this town was a also the epicenter of a religious schism in the Dutch Reformed Church. It was a seminary for theologians. That building over there the, with a the little narrow arrow, that is a museum where my mother was the curator of the museum. And many of the people who were there at that old seminary were the initial campaigners for Afrikaans language rights. And here you have to understand white Afrikaans. And we'll come to that because Afrikaans, for those of you who don't know it, is a language that was actually um, formed, a Creole that was formed on the peripheries of the society. It was spoken by the Malay slave communities and also by the Trek Boers, the itinerant farmers who had largely integrated into indigenous communities and seldom came to town. So it was really the people on the periphery. But then at that time, the Afrikaner intelligentsia took the language and conformed it more to a Western and emphasized its European roots and made it into a language of white dominance. Before that, I will show you some of the slides. Um, Afrikaans actually had two parallel developments in the Roman script and in Arabic script. So some of the earliest writings in Afrikaans are actually written in Arabic script and are conversations from the Imams. So. Uh, just to, to point that out. So there's a little red house that you see under that thick arrow with the two big elm trees in the background. That's the house that I grew up in. So that, is, that house is literally two minutes walk to the seminary. And just further to that, over there where the other arrow is, just across the road from the seminary are two monuments to the Afrikaans language. The one you will see as a head and the other one is headless. Because during the Boer War, the British toppled that monument and buried it. And they built a replica monument and put it back up again and then rediscovered the old monument. And so both of us stand there. So on my way into town, I would pass that. On the other side, in that building over there, that was the old jail. And that jail housed what was what later became the, um, the military headquarters when South Africa invaded Angola and was fighting the border war. That became the military headquarters. So literally outside my doorstep, when they in, called up all white South African males to go fight in the war, this is where they would gather. So I was constantly surrounded by troops around there. So, so just so you know that, because that to me shapes a lot of where, where I'm coming from. The, the idea that this is a language that was spoken by slave populations, moved into the country on the peripheries, taken in, turned into a language of control. So even though, white people were the minority in the region and the language was dominant. This is a language that is actually spoken. The majority of Afrikaans speakers are not Caucasian. 
So you would not say that because that's not the message that comes through. So um, I, I, that's the kind of milieu that I grew up with. And I was thinking about it now and I say that as children, when we communicated in Afrikaans, English and Corsa as situations demanded it, but I've lost Corsa since I've come here. And the words that spring to mind are, of not, after not speaking the language actively, are the words popping up from observing relationships on the farm. It's significant because I have words like Malaka, run, Kahuleza, hurry, Yizapa, come here, command words that come to me. And later, as my own relationship with the words changed, so are the words that come to mind. Words like Amandla, power, it's a call and response. Ngawe tu, Amandla, Ngawe tu, power to the people. Um, and Maibuye, Africa, come back, Africa, come back. So the language that remains, the fragments that remain, are the ones that are ingrained politically. So you cannot take away those things for me. Um, that it's curious, though, that those languages of my youth have given us two universally recognized words. The first is Ubuntu which many of you know, which is means togetherness and it's a philosophy of a shared humanity. And also it's polar opposite, apartheid, separateness. Mm. Mm. The official policy of segregation that I grew up in. And this is a double edged gift that, uh, to the world that, that also defines the conflict and the confluence that exists in my relationship to language is that it is a shared humanity, but also a conflict. So that's exactly, you know, what languages do. They bind us together, but they also create the boundaries between groups. So it's exclusion and togetherness. And that's, mm -hmm. um, that's really the, one of the social functions of language. Um, yeah. Do you have more to show us or should we pop out of your screen? Oh, um, I just wanted to show you there's some Afrikaans in Arabic script. And here's uh, oh, yeah. an example of uh, Surah 67, uh, I are one written in Arabic Afrikaans. So it, it's just a, a curiosity. And that's it. So I will pop out of that screen. I think that should have popped us out. No? No, we're still seeing your screen. Oh. There we go. Okay, there we go. Now we're back. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I am um, really struck by is the extent to which our relationships with language are shaped by our personal life trajectories. Um, that the associations we have wrapped up with language are so close to our own lived experiences. And you just touched on that really beautifully, that, uh, that your experiences of the various languages are rooted in um, the political context in which you found yourself and in the specific experiences that you had. What is your, experience, what is your relationship to Afrikaans now? As someone who lives in Alberta. <laughs> I, I yeah I speak it is a language that I speak mostly in home um, I speak it with family if we've got visitors and, but very seldom do I use it here I tend to read a lot in it and I tend to speak it on the phone in communications or in YouTube sessions with people from South Africa and write it on Facebook and things like that. But I don't really speak, but that's because I found, uh, it, you know, South African communities are very divided, the, the ones that came over. Um, there are those who came as anti-apartheid activists and who stayed. There are those who left during apartheid who, uh, because, they saw majority, black majority government coming and wanted to get out. Uh, there, are, there are those who came after independence. And so very often when you go to, to some of these places, you, you find many of the old people sink into old ways. And some of those, the old views, you will find a prevalence of, of um, old South African flags at place, some of these places. And it's just places that I feel uncomfortable with. So I tend not to do it, but Afrikaans brings a stigma. You know, I'll, uh, 
uh, just behind those two monuments, there was a tree, and I'm going to talk about that tree for a second. Uh, last year, there was, or a year or two ago, there was a case here in Alberta where, where people with a doctor and the noose that got hung on a somebody's there, and the doctor claiming that he did not know what the, the importance of it. And I go, no, because just behind those two monuments was the stump of a tree where an Afrikaner rebel had been lynched, right there. And if you look at the Namibian genocide, the just search the pictures of the Namibian genocide and you will see pictures of lynchings. Lynching is part of this. I find it incredulous that people will say they did not know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a, a mentality that follows through in, in the language, in the society. Uh, it's not doing things to, to advance the society. I also find that often when people hear me speak Afrikaans or realize that I'm South African, that it becomes a gateway. And it's as if that gives people permission to, to dig under a veneer and reveal racist attitudes here. Right, so it's presuming a shared brotherhood, if you will, in a certain exclusionary mindset, uh, a mindset yeah. that draws a wall between groups by language that's defined by language. So, so I tend to avoid the language, not because I don't enjoy it or don't speak it or don't recognize, but because I know what avenues it opens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Peter, I'm wondering if you could read us a passage from your book, Counting Teeth. I can do that. That speaks to the attempts to bridge some of the divides that uh, that are defined along language boundaries. All right. So in the book, um, Counting Teeth, where is it? There we are. I'm holding it up here now. Um, in Counting Teeth, what I do is I go back to Namibia and I try and try and account for my own implication in apartheid, my own resistance to 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 the invasion of Namibia and the prevention of independence in Namibia, the country of my birth. And so I get to a particular point where I visit a place called Olugulugumbashe, which is the site of the first battle in the Namibian war for independence. And my daughter and I are greeted at the gate by Mateus Kahumbe, who is a retired plan soldier who was be, uh, wounded at the final battle, the battle of Quito Quanavale. And so I, this is where we start. And so Mateus's grasp of English is minimal and his Afrikaans is only slightly better, but we communicate by meandering through islands of language. So you fought at Quito Quanaval. Yes, I am a man, he responds. It is not a statement about prowess or perceptions of masculinity. It is an observation that he has been through a rite of passage and that he has been changed by it. There can be no return to the time before war. I look at Mateus's face. There are no scars, as I have seen on so many older men in these parts. For Namibians, scarification signals their transition into adulthood. Mateus points to his leg. There is a small entry wound just above the knee where the bullet entered his body. Lower down along the calf, the exiting bullet has left a mangled welt. This wound is his initiation scar, marking a transition into manhood that had started at the Battle of Olugulukumbashe and ended when he was wounded in the last major battle. Guito is always with me, he says in Afrikaans. And standing there at Olugulu Bombashe, looking at Mateus's wounds, I begin to sense a connection, an invitation to share my story. We both returned, Mateus and I. The difference is that I came and left and returned again, and soon I will leave once more. Mateus returned, and every day he still returns to this place of memory. Reluctantly, I show Mateus a small scar on my own leg where a police quirt grazed me. My experience and the physical evidence are nothing compared to his, but Mateus finds commonality in that moment. He smiles. Yes, we are the wounded generation. And I know he means more than physical scars. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. yeah. One of the things I really grappled with in the book is um, the question of the in inevitability of conflict if you um, promote uh, a number of different language groups, uh, if you nurture people's sense of connection to those identities. Um, because there are some studies that have suggested that in areas where there are a lot of different linguistic or ethnic groups, uh, that these areas are more prone to violence or conflict or a diminishment of public trust. Um, and these are a little bit troubling. Um, so one of the things I've, I've really been trying to think about is, is there a way of promoting a multicultural, multilingual project that avoids people kind of breaking up into separate groups that square off with each other? And as a result of the reading that I did, my conclusion was that yes, and it looks, um, takes a very specific shape. So uh, one of the things I found is that um, the degree of correlation between diversity and conflict is much, much smaller if uh, there's a lot of mixing between groups, if people interact with each other in meaningful ways. And by that, we mean not just that they see each other at a distance, um, they hear overhear each other at a library, but that they really have the opportunity to build meaningful relationships with each other. Mm -hmm. And I was heartened by studies that show that even people who appear to be the most prone to prejudice, um, if they have positive interactions with a member of a group against which they're heavily biased, that their biases really shift. So, you know, we, it's not fair to say that people are hardened bigots um, and that there's no hope for them. In fact, these are precisely the kinds of people that are often most deeply affected by personal relationships with someone of an outsider group. And I think that squares with your own experience in South Africa as well. Is that not Absolutely. The is that the more, the more effort you put into being with people, communicating with people in social and finding ways to, to make pe people who speak other languages or from other cultures part of your own life, the more you extend your own, out of your own comfort zone, the more you find commonalities mm -hmm. and the more you do that. And so the, for someone like, yes, so for here, I think that it is about getting to know, getting to understand, to put that fear aside and to start looking rather than seeing the fear or feeling the threat of people coming in here to embrace it and to, to really try and explore and to extend and see what you can learn from that. I know I have been enriched by, by the experience of, although I'd grown up with that flexibility of moving between two white cultures in South Africa, getting to know other people, getting to know their language, getting to know their culture has been, it's been incredibly enriching as an experience. So yes, I think it can shift. It can absolutely shift. Um, when I talk about racism, I, I often, often say I'm a recovering racist mm. because it's a conscious act, act of, of thinking I am not going to engage in those behaviors. I will engage in such behaviors. I will reach out to people. Mm. I will try and make that effort on my side. And I think if we all do that, we will start overcoming these barriers. And one of the, the things that comes through in some of the research as well is the importance of generally blurred categories. Um, and that much of this blurring comes from people who really begin to feel that they belong to more than one. Um, yeah. Which of course is the case, I think, for many people who come from elsewhere uh, to Canada. Many indigenous peoples also express the, the view that they consider themselves really bicultural as mm -hmm. belonging in multiple cultures. Um, and this I think is very, very powerful because um, that's an inner experience that individuals have of negotiating uh, identities that are sometimes in conflict with each other and coming to the conclusion that even though at times they clash, they can still live side by side, even within the same person. Yeah. And it turns out that this is an incredibly uh, powerful demonstration to other people who are not bicultural as well. Um, so there are several studies that show that, uh, for instance, 
um, Israelis who read bios of Israeli Arabs um, in which they described themselves as um, belonging both to Arabic culture and Israeli society and seeing no fundamental uh, contradiction between those. After they read these profiles, um, the Israelis who were not of Arabic origin um, were then uh, probed to answer a set of questions about policy and were much less hostile towards Arabs in their responses. So simply witnessing the presence of people who express a complicated identity seems to have the potential to break down some of these between group boundaries. Now, I think that's an incredibly powerful thing. Um, so I think you're seeing this in, even in the Afrikaans language, right? There was um, an appropriation of that language, but now it's, it's starting to see a closer connection to its African origins, Absolutely. am I right? Yes, yeah. so instead of uh, there, what's happened is that where Afrikaans, standard Afrikaans, which was the white version of the language, um, has made way where suddenly it's been liberated and literature is appearing in, in many of the variants, GARPs, for instance. Um, universities are now offering entire courses in GARPs, for instance. Um, there's also Kharib Afrikaans, the, the person who won the award for Book of the Year, the South African Literature Association Award Book of the Year was written in Kharib Afrikaans. So, right. so you so have book prizes that can be awarded to multiple different languages. Absolutely. Yeah. They, uh, in all 11 South Africa's official languages, people enter books in all of them and there are, they pick one prize winner. So the, you wouldn't have, for, for example, with a GG, you wouldn't have a French category and an English category. You'd have a, a Canadian best book in Canada, and it would be whether that book was written in 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 an Algonquin language, in a Cree, in 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 any. You take it, whatever it is. It if it was written, what it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. If it's yeah, the best so book, it's the best book. To other models, there are certainly places in the world where that kind of thing is done, and where university. Yeah aren't only taught in the dominant language of the university, but that there are some accommodations that are made, some degree of translation that occurs. Um, so th these things can all be done if there's the political will to do it. Yeah, I mean, I was listening to a lecture in the Netherlands where the conversation was yesterday was moving in English, Afrikaans, Dutch, and French. Right. So, yeah, it, people moved between all all four uh, and yeah. just assumed people will follow or, or yeah, and that would be a something. much more meaningful multilingualism than the version that we have currently. Yeah. Uh, Peter, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. And I, I, saw, I was wanted, doing the same. Yeah, we wanted to leave some time for discussion. So I wonder if maybe we could close off by reading our last selections. Would, would you sounds... go? Okay. Let me, shall I go first? You said yeah, so. why don't you? Yeah. All right. So this is, uh, a, a reading from a work in progress where basically it starts with um, when Bartholomew Diaz first sails around the Cape in 1488. He happens to have with him on board four African women who had spent time in Lisbon becoming acquainted with um, European culture, metaphysics, commerce, and the intent was to return them to Africa to act as interpreters for them, and also to be emissaries to Preston John, who the Portuguese thought they were there. So one of these women was play, put down in a place called Angra Pequena, which is on the southern reaches of the Namib Desert. And, um, then that's all we know from a four line account and then they disappear. And Diaz himself, you know very, very little about his life. We know that he drowns off the southern coast of Africa in 1500. So in my book, um, Diaz awakens to find himself transformed into a baobab tree and near this and the woman goes in and she survives travels and settles and finds herself at the same ruins of a city of stone where this baobab tree is now. So this is from where she wakes up the first morning 
after walking through the night and gets encounters the city. Now a hand emerges from the thicket of faces, offering me victuals. I raise my own hand slowly. I do not want to send these creatures, the swarm skittering into the fading shadows of the morning. The one who holds the fruit in her hand encourages me by pushing the profferings closer. Still lying on the ground where I had fallen against a tree, I take it from her. She puckers her fingertips together and taps her lips, uttering a sound as she does so. I do not know the word, yet it sounds familiar. But I do understand the intent of her gesture, eat. I let the words settle in my head and I feel it reverberate as it finds company with other voices that dwell in me. I flutter as I take the food and taste the fruits of this place. I recognize the taste of the baobab. There is a yellow berry that reminds me of the mangoes we plucked from the trees in Sonio. It tastes of the sweetness of my childhood home. The woman whose name I do not know yet turns to me. I reach down and place a small stone in my hand. Uis, I say. The woman smiles. Uis, she repeats and touches a stone. It is clear she understands. I hold up my walking stick and I say, hi, and again the woman nods and repeats the word for stick. I point to more objects, feeling my confidence grow as she acknowledges each effort. You know our language, the woman says, but it sits on you like the clothes on the stranger's body. You carry our words on your tongue like the people from behind the mountain carry our words. I do not know how to answer her, for it is more complicated than that. I do not know how to say, I am from this place too. My body is shaped from this soil, but I was torn from it by the hands of men who have now determined my fate. And so I nod only and say, yes, I am from behind the mountains. Oh, that's, that's, that really uh, speaks to me because I feel that I am from behind the mountains as well. Whenever I go back to my home country, the country where I was born, I'm of it, but not of it anymore. And there's yeah, yeah. that sense of partial belonging and partial estrangement. Um, I'll close off before we open it up to a general discussion with a passage uh, that talks about the shift that's happened in Montreal. Um, so Montreal too, like South Africa, I think has come out of some of the uh, most intense and potent tensions over its language into something a little bit more, um, a little bit more generous and softer uh, as far as language goes. I suspect that some degree of language conflict will always be a part of Montreal's identity. Skirmishes between businesses and the bureaucrats charged with enforcing Quebec's language laws continue. In 2013, a particularly zealous language inspector demanded that an Italian restaurant remove from its menu items such as pasta and calamari, replacing these with their French translations. This incident, nicknamed Pastagate, aroused scorn and disbelief from all corners of the internet. And even now, English-speaking friends and family members sometimes describe encounters with store clerks or officials whose disapproval at their inability to speak French wafts about them like an aggressive cologne. Some journalists continue to rail against the threats to the French language by an encroaching bilingualism. But these incidents are not bombs in mailboxes. And over time, they feel less and less like a true characterization of the regular rhythms and linguistic exchanges between Montrealers. They're backdrops, ones that change between various scenes and acts more than they are the fabric of daily life. Far more frequent than the bristling moments of linguistic anxiety are the stretches of peaceable negotiation between languages. Most of the time, strangers meet on a pragmatic and generous ground, willing to grope around in the bag of linguistic competencies they carry with them in order to forge an understanding together. The exchange might swing back and forth between languages until the pair settles on the one best suited for the occasion. Imperfections are inoffensive, grammatical gaps are forgiven, 
self-consciousness is laid aside. Maybe it's just my own permanent state of multiplicity that has habituated me to conflict. But to me, Montreal's moments of linguistic friction seem a bit like the spicy notes that create sparks of dissonance in a gorgeous motet. It's as Robert Bringhurst wrote in his Ode to Polyphony. The discords pass, and because they pass, they contribute to the shapeliness and the wholeness of the whole. On one of my visits back to the city, I recall hearing that officials from the Office Québécoise de la Langue Française had just voiced concern about the fact that Montreal shopkeepers were increasingly greeting their customers with a bilingual bonjour, hi, a greeting that to some politicians signaled an undesirable openness to conducting the transaction in English. Predictably, the censure of the bilingual greeting caused some irritation among Anglophones. In the cab from the airport, I listened to a call-in radio program on a local English speaking station in which one caller sarcastically remarked that perhaps the OQLF would legislate that shopkeepers utter the high portion of the greeting no louder than at a whisper, an obvious reference to the signage laws which stipulate that French text be more visually prominent than English. But then I stepped into a car rental office. The man behind the desk chirped, bonjour, and I happily continued the exchange in French. But when I handed over my Alberta driver's license, he switched to English, which was, like my French, discernibly accented, but fluent and comfortable enough. I appreciated the courtesy, but persisted in French. He continued in English. Finally, I said to him in French, please allow me the pleasure of speaking in French. I rarely get to use it now that I live out West and it does me a lot of good. He smiled and we traded small talk about where I used to live as a child in Montreal and how things had changed in the local landscape. He relaxed and so did his diphthongs, sliding away from the stiffer French used between strangers into the warmer, looser sounds Quebecers utter at home. And when he handed over the keys, I felt more than welcome. And now let's hear from some of our participants. Um, so June, do you think we could stop the recording at this point? And, um...